Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Is this microphone on? Yeah, great. Okay, I just want to um, alert you that we are going to have one of our panelists speaking in French today. So if you don't speak French and you'd like to understand her presentation, please make sure that you have a translation headset on channel one, and the channel one is the English translation, okay? <clears throat> Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Can I call people to attention up here? Thank you so much. Uh, this is our second plenary session of our symposium. Uh, this session is called Religion, a Catalyst for Peace. And we are very honored today to have five wonderful speakers who have come to us from all around the world. Uh, we are going to start with Mr. Pan An Son. He is the president of the Vietnam Union of Friendship Organizations. We will then hear from Mr. Abdullah Al Shahi. He is the acting operations executive director of the Abrahamic Family House Center from UAE. Third, we're going to hear from Archbishop Peter Machada. Uh, Peter Machada is the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Bangalore in Karnataka, India. After the Archbishop, we will hear from Victor Brown. He is the senior pastor at Mount Sinai United Christian Church Incorporated in New York City, right here in the United States. And then finally, we will hear from Giselle Nadaya Luceba. She is from the National Solidarity and Humanitarian Disaster Management Fund program, and she's the former Minister of Gender, Family, and Children in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So we're really delighted to have our speakers with us today. They're going to speak for about 12 to 15 minutes each, and then we are going to have a question and answer session if we have time afterwards. So please do think of your questions, and afterwards we'll be sure to open up the floor and pass around the microphone for your questions. Thank you so much, and we are going to start with Mr. Son. Hello, hello. Yeah, okay. Distinguished guests, uh, religious leader, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to say uh, thank you very much for inviting me to attend this important symposium. Uh, as compared with uh, almost all of you here, I am a freshman because uh, this is my first time to be in. Utah, and my first time to be at this important symposium. So I'm very sorry if uh, my speech uh, does not fit all of you very well. Yeah, I have to say sorry first. Uh, first of all, I would like to say congratulations to uh, my colleagues from BYU, especially my colleagues, our colleagues from the International Center for Law and Religion Study for successfully organizing this important event. Uh, my name is Phan Anh Sơn. Uh, I come from the Vietnam Union of Friendship Organization, a social organization, a social organization working to promote the people-to-people -people diplomacy of Vietnam with uh, different countries in the world. And one of our purposes in working is to work with a social progressive movement, NGOs, people's organization, think tanks, university, and also other organization. And one of our key goals is to support the government and the people of Vietnam in the process of poverty reduction, sustainable development, as well as addressing the war legacy, helping the government with the reconciliation and normalization of diplomatic relations, especially between Vietnam and the US around 30 years ago. And uh, within the framework of uh, the important workshop uh, this afternoon, I would like to share with you uh, my 
initial thoughts for discussion on three key points. Number one, why religion and ensuring religious freedom be catalysts for peace building? Number two, how religions and ensuring religions of freedom contribute to peace building. And the last one, I would like to share some uh, experience from the context of Vietnam. Okay? Are you following me? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, because uh, you should be asleep after the fifth or seven minutes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, the first point, why religion and ensuring religious freedom be catalysts for peace building? Uh, first, religion has an inherently benevolent nature that aligns with the goal of peace building and peacekeeping. The characteristics of religions are humanism, compassion, and a focus on doing good. The original teaching of all religions encourage people to do good deeds, avoid evils, love peace, and refrain from using violence to harm others. The peaceful nature of religion is a fundamental and essential common denominator, serving as the core factor in promoting <coughs> the role of religion in peace building. Second, a large portion of religious followers forms a significant force contributing to peacekeeping and peace building. Religious adherents make up a large portion of the world's population. If we can mobilize and increase those followers to do good, avoid wrongdoings, and oppose evils. It will contribute to creating a peaceful country and preventing conflicts. Ensuring religious freedom and avoiding religious conflicts will allow us to engage these large groups of followers in useful activities, maintaining social order and peace. Religious followers are both participants in peace building and beneficiaries of peace as they seek a peaceful and prosperous life to practice their belief. In reality, many religious leaders and followers have actively contributed to peace building and peacekeeping. The participation of religious groups in Vietnam during the two wars of national independence and reunification uh, and the country's reconstruction now, which I will discuss below later, is clear evidence supporting this argument. And third, ensuring appropriate and effective religious freedom will help reduce and eliminate conflicts within or between religions, preventing the possibility of religiously motivated wars and conflicts. History has shown that conflicts might have stemmed from religion, religious tensions. Religious conflicts arise from a variety of causes. Therefore, ensuring religious freedom, cheating all religions fairly, and eliminating religious tension will help prevent wars and conflicts contributing to peacekeeping and peace building. That is my first point. The second point, how religions and ensuring religions of freedom contribute to peacekeeping and peace building. First, religious organizations need to enhance <coughs> the education and guidance of their followers to practice benevolence and religious tolerance, to do good deeds, avoid wrongdoings, and refrain from violence in interaction between individuals, communities, and between religions when resolving conflicts. Tolerance and respect are two essential virtues that must be upheld in a multi-religious society. Therefore, in addition to preaching 
tolerance. It is necessary to actively practice tolerance to create an atmosphere of peace and harmony in social life. The essence of tolerance is the solidarity between religious communities and among followers within the same reason. The term believer or faithful commonly used in Vietnam to refer to religious followers naturally contain an element of this tolerance. Building a spirit of mutual support, always embracing the thought that what I have does not take away from what other can also enjoy, and avoiding envy and resentment towards those who are more fortunate than others is crucial. Second, established a solid legal foundation to ensure religious freedom. Governments need to develop and implement a fair and strict legal framework that consistently respects religious freedom, avoids discrimination, and does not create conflicts while early and timely addressing emerging conflicts. Government must also combat any action that exploit religions to cause any social unrest or conflict. Protecting and ensuring the exercise of religion's freedom and preventing religious discrimination must be recognized as the responsibility of each country. Third, enhance the social responsibility of religion, linking the responsibilities of religious institution and followers with civic responsibilities and connecting religion with a secular society. Religion is country and is a fundamental part of the country fabric of each nation. And that the religion's first contribution is to country. When religion is introduced to a country, it enriches the host country's country. The participation of religion in strengthening the spiritual and cultural values of nations serve as a key element in fostering and consolidating cultural and ideological harmony, which is essential in preventing religious <coughs> conflicts. <coughs> My third point is uh, some experience from the context of Vietnam. As you might know, uh, Vietnam after 1975 was heavily, heavily uh, devastated because of the two uh, uh, serious wars for the national independence and reunification. After the war, around 70% of Vietnamese households were poor household. And we, Vietnamese government, and the people agreed to conduct our economic renewal starting in 1986. And so far, after almost 40 years of economic, re, uh, economic uh, renewal, as well as international integration, Vietnam is now a developing country with a population of around 100 million people and with a GDP of around 500 billion US dollar. Uh, with a equal yeah, 4,500 uh, US dollar per income per capita. And in Vietnam, we are now having around 40 religions with 16 key main religions with around 27 to 28 million yeah, followers of around over 40 religions. And uh, currently uh, we have around 
54,000 religious dignitaries, over 144,000 religious officials, and of 30,000 places of worship. Uh, some prominent, I would like to share with you some prominent <coughs> features of religions in Vietnam. Yeah, that is my last part. Number one, as a multi-belief, multi-religion country, Vietnam has never had a dominant religion throughout our history. People of different faiths and religions live harmoniously, united, and closely connected with the nation, with no religious discrimination, no conflicts or no or tension between religions. All religions are equal before the law, and the state does not discriminate based on reason or belief. Everyone is free to choose whether or not to follow a religion or belief. Religious believers are free to express their faith at home, at places of worship, or at register religious group. Religious dignitaries, official monks, and followers actively participate in social, uh, in social movements and charitable activities to alleviate poverty, making practical contribution to the development of the country. Historically, religion in Vietnam has always accompanied the nation in the struggle for independence, peace, unification, and national construction, especially during the two wars for national independence and reunification. Religious communities <clears throat> sacrificed and endured hardships always participating and contributing manpower and resources to fight against evil, defending peace and protecting the happiness of people. And I would like to end my speech here with a focus that, as I mentioned at the beginning of my speech, I am a freshman at this kind of important of symposium. And we come to Utah, especially BYU, to learn more experience, not only from BYU, from the United States, but also from other countries, especially this is a good chance for Vietnamese delegation to meet such respected uh, religious leaders from over 40 countries in the world here. So I would take this opportunity as an excellent, important opportunity for me, myself, and my colleagues from Vietnamese delegation to learn more so that we will bring uh, your experience, your lesson, your sharing back to Vietnam and working with other organizations in Vietnam to make uh, religious uh, uh, religions and religious uh, freedom can contribute more to peace building and peacekeeping. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, my friend, Mr. Son, I want to assure you that you're not the only one who's first time here in Utah or uh, at this beautiful symposium. We share in this together. So we'll be together in our um, great honor of being here uh, in the great state of Utah. Um, I wanted to take a moment to thank everybody, and especially the BYU folk and the, Jesus, and the, uh, and the Church of Jesus Christ of uh, Latter-day Saints for inviting us here to be uh, with you all today. It's really our honor uh, to be here to be part of this crucial discussion. <clears throat> Today we're going to explore one of the most significant topics of our time, how freedom of belief can be a driving force in peace building and the establishment of stable, inclusive societies. But also 
you know, we need to take reality into question. And uh, we noticed that the session was right after lunch, so I joined Mr. Sun in our great challenge of making sure that everybody's fully awake. So I brought some nice pictures to keep everybody's attention. And uh, if you'd like, you can see some uh, beautiful photos as we explore the Abrahamic family house as a case study. In an increasingly interconnected world, addressing how different faiths can peacefully coexist is essential. As public officials, religious leaders, and members of civil society, we must foster dialogue that leads to mutual respect and collaboration. My presentation today will focus on the Abrahamic Family House, AFH for short, we love our acronyms, an innovative initiative from the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, that offers a model of how faith inclusivity can contribute to building civil society and long-lasting peace. So like every good presentation, here's a table of contents. And today's presentation, I'll discuss, the, uh, I'll discuss the role that freedom of belief plays in peace building. I'll begin by examining the importance of faith inclusivity, followed by a case study of the Abrahamic Family House, a practical model for interfaith dialogue and coexistence. I'll then highlight the challenges and opportunities we face in promoting religious harmony globally, before concluding with key takeaways. So why is religious freedom important? It's not just a legal right, by the way. It's the foundation for building stable and peaceful societies. When people of different faiths are free to practice their beliefs without fear of persecution, they feel respected and included. This sense of inclusion fosters social harmony and opens doors to collaboration across communities. In the context of peace building, freedom of belief enables meaningful dialogue that transcends cultural and religious barriers. The UAE, long before there was a UAE, we have long embraced people of various faiths and nationalities, creating a vibrant society, multiculturally rooted in tolerance, and I hate the word tolerance, you tolerate a toothache, but rooted in mutual respect and understanding and spiritual openness. The AFH embodies this faith inclusivity, promoting peaceful coexistence within a diverse society. And as I mentioned, that didn't start from today or yesterday or 2019, uh, which was the year of tolerance for the UAE. It started long, long before that. And the first photo you see um, to your left is a frieze from a church that was, or a monastery that was unearthed in one of the islands close to Abu Dhabi. It dates back to the seventh or eighth century. So at the birth of Islam, uh, when Islam was still a new religion, uh, this church was there. It shows that the friezes are full. They've not been defiled, they've not been broken, they've not been defaced. It remained perfectly preserved, showcasing that the wider society very much respected uh, the Abrahamic faiths and respected the presence of Christianity in the Arabian Peninsula. Move forward a thousand years, a millennia later. Muslims are still there, surprise, surprise. But a few centuries later, we find something quite special. And this is something that's very near and dear to my heart because it actually comes from close to where I am from in the UAE, the Northern Emirates um, and Ras al-Khaimah. And this is at the tip of the peninsula. This is a place that, is, uh, that has been inhabited for thousands of years. And some of the tribesmen, I think it was in the 70s, found this stone as part of a well. And they were like, well, this has some weird writing on it. Many people back then were illiterate. Uh, education started coming in after oil and people could only read the Quran and uh, that was the modus operandi for education, really. And so they took the stone to a museum not knowing what it was. Lo and behold, when the museum saw the stone, they discovered that this was actually a Jewish tombstone dating back to the 17th century. So just a couple of hundred years ago. Now this gives us two or three key messages. It first tells us that there was a Jewish community in the UAE, in Ras al Khaim, in the middle of the mountains. They were a large community, because, well, there, at least there were more than two because someone had to write the tombstone. And they were respected and comfortable within the larger Muslim community because they were allowed to bury their dead where the population was, close to the village well, which typically is in the center of the village or close to the center of the village. People had to walk to it and they had to carry water back and forth. And they were allowed and they felt very comfortable because the tombstone is comparatively large. Uh, 
typically tombstones uh, back home are very small. This was two feet high, about 60 centimeters. So this was quite large. So it showed that the community was very comfortable and they really felt at home in the UAE. Now, of course, move forward a couple of hundred years and you have the United Arab Emirates with religious freedom and coexistence at the heart of our national identity. Sheikh Zayed, may he rest in peace, the, f the founder of the UAE, inaugurated the first church in Abu Dhabi in modern times in 1964, before the country existed. Later on, um, the UAE was a pioneer in championing uh, initiatives such as the Marrakesh Declaration, uh, which was mentioned a few times here in the Bahrain de uh, Declaration, as well as others. And then we move forward to 2019, a beautiful year. It is the year of the document of human fraternity for world peace and living together. Coined by Sheikh Ahmed al-Tayyib of al-Azhar and His Holiness Pope Francis of the Catholic Church. I remember very, very clearly five years ago when we first started hearing of the document and we first started hearing about the visit of Pope Francis to the United Arab Emirates. We were really excited because this was the first time in history that a pope comes to a country in the Arabian uh, peninsula, and it's a country that's younger than he is. Let that sink in for a moment. It's a country that's not even 50 years old, and it welcomed the Pope of the Catholic Church, and we were so inspired by that, that the idea for the Abrahamic family house was born. The design was unveiled by His Highness Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed al Hayyan, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in New York City uh, in 2019 in September, and the journey towards building the Abrahamic family house uh, was born. It was such a beautiful journey. And I want to take a moment to tell you a little bit about the design before we talk about what the Abraham, uh, Abrahamic family house does. So as you see from the picture over here, these buildings are quite similar on the outside, but they're different from the inside in a beautiful metaphor to our faiths. We're very similar on the outside. We have a lot in common, but there are some elements that are like gems inside these beautiful buildings, inside our beautiful faiths that are unique and they give each faith its beauty and its uniqueness. And these are elements that actually, I think, should bring us together and not separate us. The AFH includes a mosque, a church, and a synagogue. Each of these buildings are of exactly the equal size. There is not one building that is taller than the other. There is not one building that is wider than the other. There is not one building that is deeper than the other. And actually, they almost cost the same thing to the cent to build, which I think is absolutely incredible. On the outside, you see different facades, and they each speak to the faith in, a, in their own way. I'm happy if you find me later on. I can talk your ears off about it, but I won't uh, bother you with the details of the architecture right now. But on the inside, they're quite, uh, they're quite unique and different. And actually having been there every day of the week for the past couple of years, I can tell you that each building feels different when you walk in. It has a very unique feeling that you get as soon as you set foot into the house. All right, there we go. And as I was mentioning, so these houses are exactly equal. We are looking at the houses right now from the main entrance. And I wanted to situate the Abrahamic family house for you on Saadiyat Island in Abu Dhabi. It's situated in a place that is surrounded by cultural institutions, by institutions of knowledge. Because for us, the AFH is not just a place of worship. It is a place of worship. It's three places of worship that are very, very close to each other. They're not that far apart. But on the flip side, uh, there is a space of knowledge in the middle. It's surrounded by the Zayed National Museum, the National Museum of the UAE. It's surrounded by the Louvre Abu Dhabi, which talks about the history of humanity through art. The Guggenheim Abu Dhabi is right next door, which is going to be a modern art museum that brings the world together. And the Natural History Museum Abu Dhabi is going to be across the street that tells you a beautiful history of our planet. And it has the biggest T-Rex, which I find really cool, uh, skeleton. It's called Stan. And then there is a team lab institution called Phenomena, which enables kids of all abilities and ages to come and have fun. So the houses of worship. I have pictures here 
of the first three celebrations that took place at the Abrahamic family house. Start with the mosque at the Eminence Ahmed al Tayyib Mosque, named after Ahmed al Tayyib, the Grand Imam of Al Azhar. And then at the church in the first mosque, dedicated to St. Francis of Assisi, at the request of Pope Francis. And actually, the priest taking care of the church is a Franciscan uh, priest. And finally, the synagogue dedicated to Maimonides, one of the most pre preeminent philosophers and rabbis in the Jewish faith. And this was the first prayer at the synagogue. So these were the first prayers, but what does the Abrahamic family house look like today? I can tell you that these may have been the lowest numbers of worshipers since we inaugurated. We've been very, very blessed that the faithful find prayer at the Abrahamic family house extremely rewarding. I'm very happy to announce that we've, to, to date, since the inauguration in February 2023, welcomed more than 200,000 worshipers at the Abrahamic family house. That's been in 18 months. And just to give you context, if the AFH is bursting at the seams, if we're absolutely full, there is about 800 worshipers on site. That means that in the past 18 months, in the past 500 days, for more than 200 days, that building was full. That house was completely full to the brim. And we've seen so many beautiful stories. Just a few days ago, we celebrated the Jewish uh, high holidays of Rosh Hashanah. I had about 600 Jewish people come and pray at the Abrahamic family house over the holidays. At the same time, uh, the Franciscan church uh, celebrated the feast of St. Francis of Assisi on the 4th of October. And about 200 members of the Christian community came to celebrate at the AFH. At the same time, of course, in the mosque, uh, we celebrate the five prayers. And on Friday, about 1,500 people came to pray at the mosque. That's about three times the capacity of the mosque, by the way. Anyway, at the AFH, we have the preeminent zone of conflict taking place right on our grounds. It's the parking lot. <laughs> Everybody parks in a 200 space parking lot. But given the numbers I've told you, there are many more people coming to park than there are to pray. And there are spaces in the AFH. It's beautiful that there has been not a single conflict between the communities in the past year and a half since we inaugurated. There has not been nothing in the past week as well. So everybody came together in peace and they continue coming together in peace. So let's talk about religious freedom and how we make this happen. We have three approaches at the AFH that we partake. The first thing is educational programming. And here, for us, education is not just about academia, it's not just about courses. It's about many different things and many different elements. We'll look at leadership. We'll look at inclusivity and accessibility. And we also look at academia, fellowships, and scholarships. And I'll give you some examples uh, in a little moment. The one I wanted to talk about really here is our community initiatives. And these are the bedrock of the AFH. And they're something, and I'm a little bit biased, but they're something that really is heartwarming. When we first started the AFH, we thought, who is this for? And quickly realized that this is for the children. This is for future generations. This is not for us. We're, we've already been there, done that. But the kids hold the future. And kids don't have the biases and preconceptions that we have as adults. So we started engaging with children through art. Art is the great equalizer. It's the expression. It's the beauty that brings people together. No matter what language you speak, no matter where you come from, no matter what you look like, no matter what your background is, art brings everybody together. And so we brought kids from the three communities, Muslims, Christians, and Jews. And we made sure to put at least one kid from each community at the same table. And we had them create something. It could have been paper mache, flower arrangements, like these beautiful ones we have here, or candle making. Lo and behold, these kids became friends. And as you, many of you know, those of you who are parents, if somebody needs to make you friends with somebody you really don't like, you just make sure that your kids are friends. And that will make sure that you become friends. And the parents became friends. And they started coming together. These workshops were for 50 kids once a month. We now conduct them for 100 kids every week. And I have 300 kids waiting at the entrance every single week. 
And of course, we champion inter interfaith through everything that we do. But then, what are some of the challenges? And uh, technology is my best friend today, there we go. And opportunities that we have. Of course, we're affected by everything that happens around us. But this gives us a way to foster a harmonious environment that's a proof point to bring people together. We share the transformation power of dialogue in everything that we do. And we build bridges across cultures to bring people together. I promise to tell you a little bit of our programming. And so I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. I realize that I only have one or two minutes left. Um, I talked about inclusivity. We teach sign language and braille at the Abrahamic Family House. I talked about bringing people together. Well, we can all bond, no matter where we're from, about the challenges we have with children and our kids and how we raise them up in the challenging times that we live in today. And also, we train young people in leadership and in emotional intelligence and empathy. So we discussed the challenges and opportunities a little bit. And I just wanted to raise a few items that we can discuss later on. Of course, global challenges are critical today. What's happening around us is not something that we can ignore. But what we can do about it is ensure that the people having the conversation do so from a platform of love for each other. We are countering religious intolerance, but you start from the household, the smallest unit of society not at the macro level, because we're all here. We represent 40 different countries, countless religions, and we get along very well and very fine. I see that every day since we've come here to this beautiful state. It's about people in the household, the average Joe, Isaac, and Muhammad. And finally, promoting peaceful coexistence. And how do we do that? By spreading the word, by telling people that there is another way, there is a better way. We need to strengthen our dialogue and come together in a culture of peace. We need to promote religious literacy and ensure that people know what they're talking about and know the other faiths as well. And finally, we can't just focus on our communities, which is important, but we also need to spread the word. Thank you so much. Thank you to BYU and my colleagues. It's my turn now. We have finished Vietnam, we have finished UAE, and now it's India. On a similar platform of Asia, and perhaps we share many things together, and I'm so happy to hear of the exchanges because it enriches us also as to what perhaps we can try and do also. I say, I'm here. My first question is, where am I? And I say, I'm at B, U, V, I, U. So I am at this place, which is beautiful and has perhaps lessons for us for all over the world. I would say we are discussing about religion and peace. Mother Teresa would say, peace begins with a smile. And so I think if you all smile together, we will always or perhaps already be in peace together. You know, the talk or the topic of religion is very enduring at the same time, very sensitive. I don't say dangerous. But then, in a situation like ours of today, when two-thirds of the world is affected by religious conflicts, perhaps we are very, very few. We are very, very soft. We are very, very sensitive. But then, as prophets of a generation, Perhaps we hold small candles of little light with us, with little hope with us. You know, the word religion itself, this, the root comes from Latin religio or religere, which has got many meanings. And one of the meaning is to bind together, to link together. And so religions or the, the responsibility or the role of the religion should have been to link together, to bind together. Unfortunately, religion is not binding us, it's rather separating us, it's creating conflicts among us, it's creating problems for us. So that is why our meeting like this is very important that at least there are few persons who think alike 
of the good things that can come out of religion and especially the bonding that we are speaking about. I shall, I'm very, I'm aware of the time and the time and tide waits for no man. I wish it waited for me a little. I shall take six points that I have, but I'll try to be very short so that I spend much time on the last point that's about India. First of all, freedom of religion is very important for all of us. As uh, I think Katerina Lantos said yesterday, this morning, that religion, freedom of religion is at the root of all the other freedoms. If the freedom of religion is not there, perhaps what's the use of the other freedoms? Because they are only corollaries of these important aspects of freedom itself. And therefore, every religion is considered as divinely revealed in as much as it is a divine phenomenon, it has the potential of being adhered with utmost reverence. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We hear in the Christian scriptures in Proverb chapter 1, verse 7. And so my the six points that I would like to briefly refer to, I would say the first is, let us try to remove the negativity or the obstacles to peace. Uh, secondly, you know, every religion at the core has got what we call a prelude to peace and harmony. Every religion. There's no religion that speaks of hatred as such. Every religion speaks of peace and harmony. Thirdly, reconciliation and dialogue are very important. The history of religions, the history of the world itself is such that religions have divided us, religions have persecuted us. So therefore, perhaps a new chapter, we have to start somewhere of reconciliation and dialogue. And fourthly, religion as divinely revealed can inspire good behavior and conduct. And that is what we want. Fifthly, good religious adherence and religious practice can lead to good state policies, or I would say state politics because politics is playing too much in religion also today. And finally, I speak about India, my own country. So first of all, let us try to remove the negativity or obstacles to peace. Karen Armstrong says, fundamentalism has emerged in every major religious tradition, and that's an impediment to religious cooperation for the common good. Our own Mother Teresa says, if we have no peace, we have forgotten that we belong to each other. If we have no peace, we have forgotten that we belong to each other. And St. Francis of Assisi, whose feast we celebrated two days ago, says, and his prayer is a beautiful prayer, which perhaps many of you know, Lord, make me an instrument of peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow peace. Where there is injury, pardon, where there is despair, hope, and where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. A beautiful prayer, a prayer for all of us. And therefore, an honest search and religious path would entail acknowledging the conflicts of the past. We can't wipe away the past. We can, we, sometimes we say, forgive and forget. Perhaps forgive, yes, but Forgetting is very difficult. But then reconciliation would also mean that trying to forget the past, reconcile with the past. And this begins at every level, starting with me, with each one of us, at personal level. At personal level, I can preach to the whole world, but if I am not peace at myself, perhaps it's incomplete. And therefore, at personal level, at intrapersonal level, at interpersonal level, at the level of groups, at the national level, at international level like this, we have to be together. Mahatma Gandhi used to say, the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. Are we strong or are we weak? Because if we cannot forgive, we are still weak. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. Pope John Paul II 
in his message at the World Day of Peace said, no peace without justice and no justice without forgiveness. Sorry. We have to learn to forgive. Uh, secondly, we also speak of what's called the core teaching of all the religions. I think our Vietnamese panel member said it beautifully. Do not do, to un, uh, uh, do, not un, do not do unto others what you do not want to be done to you. The Christian faith says in everything to do, everything, do to others as you would have done to you. This is the law and the prophets. Matthew chapter 7 verse 12. The Jewish faith says, what is hateful to you do not do to your fellow men. That is the entire law and all the rest is only commentary. The Muslim faith says, no one of you is a believer until he desires that his, for his brother that which he desires for himself. Hadith. The Hindu faith in uh, the, what is called the holy book of Mahabharata says, this is the sum of duty. Do not to others if done to thee would cause thee a pain. And the Buddhist faith would say, hurt not others with that which pains to yourself. The Bhaya faith would say, and if thine eyes be turned towards justice, choose those for thy neighbor, that which thou choosest for yourself. And the Zoroastrian faith would say, whatever is disagreeable to yourself, do not do unto, unto others, which means every faith has at the core doing good to the others, not doing evil to the others. And so where are we reached? Why are we in this state and status today? And therefore, my third point would be very specially to say that perhaps we have to think of reconciliation and dialogue, which I shall speak when I come to the Indian part, because we are learning also this process, how dialogue can help each other. My fourth point is religion as divinely revealed can inspire good behavior and conduct. That's important. You know, the religion is the one side of the coin. The life is the other side of the coin. What's good if the, your religion is so good and so high, but your life is something else? The both have to match together. And therefore, Mahatma Gandhi would say, there is no religion higher than truth and righteousness. Truth and righteousness, the highest form of religion that perhaps is practical or translated into the daily message of life. And the universal message of world religions, especially religious leaders, can help resolve conflicts through the core values they, they proclaim. Secondly, interfaith cooperation that can be shared, that can have shared values evident to each other. Religious leaders, especially the leaders of different religions, can contribute to conciliation and mediation effects. Charismatic leaders of bygone days and today, today with vision and courage can inspire the present generation. Faith communities like the Christian community, the Muslim community, the Hindu community, perhaps every community can give voice to the marginalized people when we serve the poor. Perhaps some part of our religion is put into practice and we are challenged ourselves as to put into practice our religion. And finally, religion can boost the progress of civilization. I think yesterday was a beautiful, we had Elder Alexander who gave us a beautiful expression that how religious freedom also brings progress and prosperity to our country. And that's very important also because where there are no religious conflicts, the economy develops, the prosperity comes up, the people are at peace, and surely there's a lot of harmony. I say that religious freedom reduces corruption. There is corruption in many of our countries. I would say of, I can't say there's less corruption in India. There is corruption everywhere. But good religious practice reduces corruption because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, is the beginning of our social concerns, as it were. Uh, secondly, religious freedom en engenders peace by reducing religion-related violence and conflicts. Religious freedom is associated with global growth. 
In order to foster sustainable growth of economy, it is the duty of the government to ensure protection of minority groups, human rights, especially rights and liberties of all religious groups. And freedom is good for business. It's for stability. And where stability exists, there is more opportunity to invest and conduct normal and predictable business operations. Lastly, I come to India, my own country. As you know, ours is a big country. It's almost a subcontinent. We are 1.42 billion people. And uh, almost coming closer to China, with 80% Hindu population, 14% Muslim population, the Christian population is just 2.3, and the other six Buddhist Parsis and the others are about 2%. And so with this population, what we call the grind of the different religions, I know that it's not easy. We have a government now which is a good government, which is doing a lot of things for progress and prosperity, a lot of development, but then perhaps a little of improvement or challenges we have on the religious side. There is also that feeling that the majority as someone said yesterday, where uh, as the king reigns, the people also follow. And with this sort of majoritarian opinion of a Hindu Rashtra, there is inclination that everything should be also one religion, one country, one election. And these challenges we also we have. You know, we have a beautiful constitution. The Article 25 of our constitution says that all citizens are equally entitled to freedom and conscience and the right to freely profess, preach, and propagate religion. This is our constitution. But, ironically, India is one of those few countries where the right to propagate is both a fundamental right and a criminal offense also. Twelve of the 35 states of India have already passed so-called so -called anti conversion laws with names such as freedom of religion. A beautiful name, but a different connotation. To prevent conversion from one religion to another through forcible and fraudulent means by allurement or inducement with stringent penalties and punitive actions. But the interpretations of the terms forcible, fraudulent, allurement, inducement have created a lot of confusion, even in the legal terms. This is a legal uh, forum and uh, a law college. I don't know how you would interpret these terms there. And uh, the, uh, they have stifled the real meaning of the freedom of religion as embodied in the constitution of the country. My final intervention would be to say, what is the solution? What is the solution, especially for my country? I would say perhaps there are three directions in which the solution can be pointed towards. Number one is education. As our friend from uh, Asia have said that education is very important and especially for the little children. Forget about our generation, but let's give the new generation a new idea, a new world vision by good education. Uh, secondly, we say that our reaching out to the poor India is a country, of course, we have the extremes, the richest and the poorest there. And therefore I say that perhaps by trying each of our religious groups, trying to reach out to the poor, perhaps we'll have converted our religious tenets into something that is practical for all of us. And thirdly, I call it dialogue. Dialogue. A dialogue at five levels. First of all, dialogue at the level of life. What's the dialogue the life of I? I am a Christian. You are a Muslim, you are a Hindu, but for us the birth and death mean same. The marriage is the same. I can join your marriage celebration, I can join your happy celebrations and so forth. Dialogue of life. When there is a death in the family, why not that I can reach out to the others? Because death is common to everybody. Covid didn't distinguish or perhaps separate us from religion wise. Everyone had Covid. And therefore, let us reach out in that dialogue of life. And secondly, dialogue of celebration. We have feasts with us. 
We have the Hindu feast of Diwali, Deepavali, of the lambs we call it. We have the Ramjan feast of the Muslims. We have the Christmas. And see, we have to celebrate together. In our schools, in our Christian schools, we have made it compulsory that these three feasts are celebrated in every school. Perhaps not liturgically or spiritually, but at least the social celebration of Deepavali, of lighting the lamps, of a Ramjan that is preluded with a good fast, and also the Christmas celebration, which is now a national type of a celebration, everyone celebrates. Thirdly, dialogue of service. Dialogue of service. When we run our hospitals, when I run our social centers, perhaps we can join the others. We can take help from the others. We can take the resource persons from the others. In some of our hospitals, we have the Muslim doctors who are very good doctors. We have the Hindu nurses and the others. So I would say the last is religion of the dialogue of religions and dialogue in the time of crisis. So this is what perhaps I would close with. I'm sorry, I was a little long. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, God be richly thanked for this grand opportunity he has afforded us that we might gather together anew under the auspices of his grace. I'm Bishop Victor Allen Brown, Suffolk Bishop of the Worldwide Fellowship of Independent Christian Churches headquartered in Canton, Ohio, and the senior pastor of the Mount Sinai United Christian Church situated in Staten Island, New York. I am plenty proud and Honeymoon happy to have my beautiful bride, Reverend Nicole Brown, accompany me to the 31st Annual International Law and Religious Symposium, which has as its primary focus religious freedom as a means of building peace sponsored by the BYU Law International Center of Law and Religion. I want to respectfully acknowledge the distinguished international luminaries whom I have the distinct honor to share this plenary segment, and to all of the delegates hailing from around the, the globe, God be thanked for our gathering. We gather this afternoon under a heavy cloud of national and international unrest and warfare. Today marks the one year anniversary of the attack on Israel by Hamas which represents the second most number of Israeli lives lost since the Holocaust. In addition to conflicts in Haiti and Sudan, the ongoing wars in Syria, Myanmar, Somalia, Yemen, Russia, and Ukraine. On the American national front, the United States presently stands as a nation divided. One of the greatest tenets of our democracy has always been that we are one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Without question, this tenet is under heavy assault. The political landscape USA has been marred by mean-spirited and visceral engagement that has reduced healthy and spirited debate into a state of tribalism and power play. The interest of the needy has been supplanted by the interest of the greedy. And I suspect the founding fathers are turning over in their respective graves, never having imagined that the day would come wherein partisan politics would eclipse patriotism and that who controls the branches of government remains more important than an unwavering and uncompromising conviction to uphold the Constitution. In the last 10 years, acts of racism and prejudice have rearisen to soil the fabric of an America allegedly united. According to USA facts, between 2014 and 2022, the three most prevalent biases were anti-black, anti-Jewish, and anti-gay male. Over that period, anti-black hate crimes increased 108%, anti-Jewish crimes increased 83%, and 
and anti-gay male crimes increased 76%. And these statistics do not even take into consideration the reckless and irresponsible rhetoric espoused by certain politicians regarding asylum seekers aspiring for a new life here in America. And against the backdrop of the insidious madness of warfare abroad and the challenges of political, racial, and religious unrest at home is the clarion call affirmed by David in Psalm 24 and 1, wherein he emphatically observes that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and they that dwell therein. And it is into this madness that God is seeking participants and change agents to join his campaign to exalt peace where there is war, hope where there is despair, love where there is hatred, order where there is chaos, and unity where there is a divide. And without fear of contradiction, I would advocate that religion can and should serve as a catalyst for peace in the world. Each religion has a primary source of dogma that gives foundation to its belief system and so whether it is the Bible embraced by Christians or the Holy Quran embraced by Muslims or the Torah embraced by the Jews or the Vedas em em embraced by Hindus or the Pitaka embraced by Buddhists, each teach, number one, a submission to a high authority or power, number two, a trust that good ultimately triumphs over evil, number three, that the sanctity of human life is to be cherished and protected. And number four, that peace and justice are ineluctable moral virtues bestowed upon the whole of humanity, not simply as a privilege, but as an inalienable right. And so I must remark that I have thoroughly enjoyed all who have come before me by way of presentation and the myriad of ways in which the topic of religion's role in taking up the gauntlet of peace's pursuit has been engaged. For the remainder of the time afforded to me this afternoon, I want to mount the platform of my own Christian faith and to offer you a hermeneutic subspecia attenitatis or from the perspective of heaven as it relates to the process involved in becoming an instrument of peace. It is a three-step process which begins with a conviction captured in the head it is then given context by way of a transformation of the heart and then culminates with the commission of the hands. And as to the commission of the conviction of the head, I point to the eighth century theologian philosopher St. Augustine, who postulated the existence in the human order of a twofold truth. Says Augustine, there is a truth that can be arrived at by the employment of the human senses, what is seen what is felt, what is touched, what is heard. But then there is a truth, suggests Augustine, that lies outside of the realm and reach of the human senses, and it is called revelation. My faith teaches me that the Bible contains the revelation of the word, the will, and the way of God. And in perusing the Bible, we encounter the revelation of the Jehovistic attributes of God. Study long enough and you will discover that God is identified as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who makes provision, Genesis 22. He is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that grants healing, Exodus 15. That he is Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, our banner, Exodus 17. That he is Jehovah M. Kadash, the Lord who sanctifies, Exodus 31. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord who is ever present, Ezekiel 48. And then he is Jehovah Shammah, Shalom, the Lord of our peace, Judges 6. One of the ways in which peace is defined is a solid, enduring relationship of harmonious living together based on respect, serenity, cordiality, and mutual understanding. This definition of peace in my assessment can never be achieved in any of us 
if it is simply remains a matter of the head. Following after peace as a standard will always remain high and lofty to the human disposition who innately leans towards being at peace with those who bring peace and being in conflict with those who bring conflict and who will seek to match any level of aggression it encounters. The predisposition of spiritually and morally unregenerated humans is to match hate with hate, to match aggression with aggression, to match assault with retaliation, and to match persecution with revenge. True peace can never be realized if it is simply a cognitive concept couched in the head. And so in order for us to become an instrument of peace, in order for peace to stand a chance, it cannot simply be a cognitive conviction of the head, but it must be matched by a transformation of the heart. And in my faith tradition, this is the work of Holy Spirit. It requires of us a level of submission by faith to the sovereign prerogative of God who is always seeking to stretch us in ways that assault our base nature's proclivities. How can we love our enemies, bless them that curse us, do good to them which despitefully use us and persecute us unless we experience a transformation of heart that causes us to perpetually seek the moral high ground when confronted with conflict? Transformation of heart requires of us that we understand and embrace the love ethic of God. A study of the New Testament will reveal that whenever the word love is employed, etymologically it is never eros, which is superficial. It is never phileo, which is reciprocal. But it is always agape, which is unselfish and unconditional. In Mark 12, verses 30 and 31, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, declares, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is likened unto the first that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. The love ethic of God teaches us in 1 John 4 and 20 that it is theologically impossible to be in right standing with God if we claim to love vertically without concomitantly loving horizontally. It is within the parameters of God's love ethic that we come to understand that we are called to love others for God, that we're not called to love others for God, but that we are called to love others like God. And so becoming an instrument of peace in the human order not only requires of us a conviction of head and a transformation of heart, but it is culminated by a commission of our hands. Transformed hearts have the capacity and the power to mount the stage of ecumenism, as Dr. Q. English so eloquently challenged us on last evening, and pledged to foster an agenda of sustained peace. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was clearly correct when he observed that change never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability says David in Psalm 34 and 14, depart from evil, do good, seek peace, and pursue it. Mahatma Gandhi was all, also right when he challenges us all to become the change we wish to see in this world. Martin King also warns that it is not enough to say we must not wage war. It is necessary to love peace and to sacrifice for it. True peace is not merely the absence of tension, it is the presence of justice. In Luke 4, Jesus walked into the temple and read from the book of Isaiah. He declared, among other things, that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him and that he was appointed to preach the gospel to the poor. And the etymology of poor in this text carries with it a dual obligation. From the Hebrew word and I, the first obligation is to attend to the destitute and deprived, but the concomitant obligation is to challenge the systems that create, support, and perpetuate the state of deposition, deprivation. The tricky business of peacemaking is that arriving at the destination of peace more often than not requires that we cannot hold our peace. Ineluctable, from the pursuit of peace 
is the challenge of creative and strategic confrontation. The deafening silence of the prophetic voice of the faith community will always have peace as an aspiration, but will never experience it as a reality. We are called by God to speak truth to power and to challenge institutions of structured evil, which perpetuates warfare and unrest. In my conclusion, Jesus declared in Matthew 5 and 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. God is calling each of us to become instruments of peace. Let us all experience a conviction of head, a transformation of heart, and then a commitment of hands to the hard and tedious, yet rewarding and liberating work of pursuing peace. Pursuing peace, my brothers and sisters, is true religion at work. May we all embrace the challenge with the understanding that all that is necessary for the forces of evil to win out in this world is for enough good people to do nothing. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Mes gentlemen, ladies and participants, hello. Je suis Gisèle Dal. I am Gisèle Jusuba. Ministre honoraire du genre famille et enfants. The family and the ministry and president of the administration of the council of the taking care of the humanitarian catastrophes. I would like to thank first of all those that have allowed us to be able to meet in this state of Utah because the first time as my friend said that I'm here it's my first time and I uh, want to thank the organization that have made their choice in my person my humble person that brought my little contribution as an activist of the rights of women, you'll be able to realize I'll have an accent a little bit stronger than that what is about families and not talk about why not talk about the woman. In a context, global context marked by conflicts, division, inequalities, humanitarian crisis, and more particularly in my country, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, DRC, which, as you know, has been confronted for almost three decades with armed violence, causing the death of more than 10 million people, causing a complex and persistent humanitarian crisis, leading to the destruction of basic social infrastructure, severe food insecurity, massive displacement of populations, and making the DRC the world capital of rape and all forms of violence against women and children. It is therefore essential to understand how religion can play a positive role in promoting peace and reconciliation. It was asked to me to talk about the religion as a catalyzer for peace, but I didn't want to come with pictures to show how today, without peace, the country is a mess. And I'd like to talk about it later to be able to show how in my country women are raped. The country is destroyed until the last of their own energy. Religion with its values of compassion, justice, and reconciliation can play a key role and be instrumental in the promotion of peace. Even if it must be acknowledged, it can also be instrumentalized to exacerbate conflicts. It is therefore essential to understand how we can make religion a vector of lasting peace. Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, promoting world peace requires concerted efforts at all levels of society, combining several approaches, diplomacy, economic development, protection of human rights, religious and cultural initiatives, advancement of women, etc. Without pretending to be exhaustive on such complex question, uh, we will try to make our modest contribution by proposing three approaches 
namely the religious humanistic and humanistic and the feminist approach. In the religious approach, the religion has an Im immense potential to contribute to world peace, and they do that by promoting the values of tolerance, respect, and justice, and by actively working to resolve conflicts, religious leaders and institutions can play a crucial role in promoting peace and reconciliation, especially by promoting tolerance and mutual understanding. By promote, promoting these values, the leaders, religious leaders and the teachings they promote can encourage their followers to adopt an attitude of respect and understanding towards others, regardless of their beliefs or backgrounds. This is an opportunity to call on religious leaders in the Middle East and other regions of the world affected by chronic violence to transcend themselves and take action to promote mutual tolerance and understanding for the benefit of their people by a communication that is responsible. Through mediation and conflict resolution, religious leaders can also use their moral authority to encourage the parties to negotiate and find peaceful solutions. Their position of respect and influence in the community can be a valuable asset in facilitating dialogue and reconciliation. In my country, the DRC, religious leaders and their organizations have often played a mediating role in major political crises. Their involvement in the negotiations of the various political transitions has made it possible to ease tensions and promote peaceful tr transitions. Through education and raising awareness, the religious leaders can play a key role in educating their followers on the importance of peace and reconciliation. By integrating messages of peace into their teachings and sermons, they can positively influence the attitudes and behaviors of their communities. Through humanitarian assistance, religious organizations contribute significantly in alleviating suffering and creating the conditions necessary for lasting peace. At this time, let me talk about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That today, I came to testify for their accompanying in my country. Ladies, gentlemen, dear participants, it is an opportunity for me to highlight the high contribution of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to world peace and particularly in the DRC. It plays a very significant role in the promotion of peace in the Republic of Uzbekistan, of, of Congo, my country, through various humanitarian development initiatives. I would like to mention here the support of community development projects that have contributed in improving local infrastructure, access to drinking water, and health services in devastated areas affected by the horrors of war in the east of my country. Funding for education and vocational training programs that have helped youth and adults acquire skills that improve their economic and social prospects. Direct humanitarian aid provided to affect populations, including distributions of food, clothing, as you know, it has also helped the women. In a, when the has, husband dies, the wife must follow different cultural practices, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has taken the initiative to organize weddings in the, the city hall to allow that woman to have be able to take care of herself and be independent. This is what we are asking. Uh, the religious, all the, the religious structures is to help the women. The public establishment that I lead as uh, the head of the National Solidarity and Humanitarian Disaster Management Fund, whose mission is to strengthen the leadership I've got 
has helped, I've had to help in the east of the DRC, and the church has helped. I take this opportunity to reiterate on my behalf of my people and the third of my country my sincere and deep thanks. What about the humanistic approach? Lasting peace cannot be achieved by force or violence, but by the satisfaction of the basic needs of humanity, social justice, economic development, and human solidarity. By taking a humanistic approach and working together to solve global problems, we can create a more passive, peaceful and equitable world. This is the whole meaning of the famous adage, peace without the sword but with bread, which is not only an ideal but a necessity for the future of humanity. Peace through strength is a lasting illusion. History is replete with examples where the use of force has failed to bring about lasting peace. World wars, regional conflicts, and military interventions have often left deep scars and lasting resentments. This is the case of armed conflicts in the Great Lakes region and particularly in the DRC with a cycle of violence that has lasted almost three decades. Violence begets violence. And armed conflicts create cycles of revenge and hatred that perpetuate instability and insecurity. Peace through bread is a humanistic approach that is based on the satisfaction of the basic needs of each individual. I come back to the church to say that the church has used one method to bring the bread so that we can talk about peace today in DRC. The lasting peace needs economical and social inequalities and more major conflicts. By reducing these inequalities and ensuring an equitable distribution of resources, we can create an environment conducive to peace. That was about the humanistic approach. What about the feminist approach? The combination of women's efforts and religious values can be a powerless lever for the promotion of peace. Contemporary and even modern history informs of the crucial role women have played in promoting peace by using their faith to inspire and guide their communities towards peaceful actions. The inspiring role of model, a model is Mother Teresa, who used her Catholic faith to serve the poor and promote peace, or Malala Yousafzai, defended the right of the education for girls in Pakistan, becoming a powerful voice for peace and equality, or even Leima Gabawi in Liberia, who mobilized thousands of Christians and Muslim women to end the civil war in that country. The balance of humanity and peace are conditioned by the involvement and responsibility of women as essential actors. This is what nature wants. The woman is a center of peace starting from her home, her family, and all the rest of her environment. It has free dispositions and capacity to create or even destroy it. Religion must liberate women and be actively involved in their development and participation in the construction of peace. We take advantage of this forum to launch a vibrant appeal to religious leaders to be actively involved in breaking down the religious and even cultural barriers that prevent women from promoting themselves in society and becoming true actors of peace. Efforts are being made, of course. However, they are shy of making a significant difference. We recommend more the involvement of religious leaders and religious organizations to offer educational programs and awareness raising that strengthen women's skills in mediation and conflict resolution. These programs can include training on nonviolent communication, negotiation and leadership, enabling women to play an active role in the peace process. In conclusion, for religion to be a true catalyst for peace, it is essential to promote an interpretation of religious teachings that emphasizes tolerance, mutual respect, and justice. 
Religious leaders have a crucial role to play in this process by educating their faithful, encouraging concrete actions for peace, and actively engaging in mediation and conflict resolution, as well as humanitarian interventions. Moreover, the satisfaction of the basic needs of humanity, social justice, economic development, human solidarity, and the involvement of women in the peace process can be a real driver of reconciliation and peaceful coexistence for lasting peace. I would like to sincerely thank you and that your, what you have brought will be welcome in the process of peace in our country, the Democratic Republic of Congo. I thank you. Thank you all so very much. Uh, we have been richly fed uh, this afternoon, and I just want to go through a couple of uh, highlights for me from each of the presentations. I really appreciated uh, Mr. Son's uh, emphasis and on the, the principle that what I have doesn't take away from what others can enjoy. And this idea that you know pluralism entails uh, allowing others to enjoy their uh, religious beliefs that may be very different from your own. Um, Mr. Al-Shahi, uh, what a wonderful presentation on the Abrahamic family house. I love the concept that you spoke about starting at the household level, you know, starting at the most basic and fundamental unit of society. And it reminded me of a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt uh, when they were negotiating the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in uh, 1958, she said, human rights starts in small places close to the home. Um, and I thought that was such a beautiful um, recognition on your part with the wonderful work that you are doing. Um, Archbishop Machado, I, I loved um, your linguistic approach to religion, that it's something that binds us together, that it's something that links us together. And then, of course, your um, recitation of Mother Teresa, if we have no peace, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. What a wonderful statement in this conference on peace. Um, uh, Pastor Brown, um, the role of religion in taking up the gauntlet of peace and this idea that true peace can't be realized so long as it is a cognitive conviction of the head. Um, it must be matched by the heart. And what a wonderful call, I think, to all of us um, to put to use our heart and our hands yes. in this idea of reaching real, real peace. And then finally, Giselle, I loved hearing your French. It reminded me of being a missionary in France. Um, but thank you so much for your contribution to the conversation that religion really does contribute to a durable peace and that we have to have multiple institutions of society with moral authority to facilitate reconciliation and peace. And of course, we're so very honored to be part of um, that in your country in Congo. And thank you so much for um, discussing the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and our efforts in your country. Thank you very much. Um, we are at the end of our time, and I have been asked by my boss to be on time. So we are not going to have time for questions, but I just want to ask the audience to please give another round of applause for our wonderful panel.